please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Levi Leipheimer. It's September 11th, 2001, and I'm in one of the biggest bike races in the world, the Vuelta a España, the Tour of Spain. The race began three days earlier in Salamanca, where I placed third in the opening prologue time trial, at which time was the biggest result in my career. But on this day, stage four, as we're heading into the city of Gijón in the last 20 miles, another rider from Great Britain, David Miller, asks me, if I've heard of the Twin Towers falling down in New York. At the time, I thought he was asking me some sort of riddle, so I brushed him off as, as I was trying to concentrate on the racing. And um, Minutes after crossing the finish line and jumping on the team bus, I saw my first images of 9-11. The next three weeks circumventing Spain were incomprehensible as America was under attack and, and I was rocketing up the ranks of professional cycling. I oscillated between third and fifth as we raced over the Asturian, Pyrenean, and Andalusian mountains. But three weeks later, as we made our way into Madrid, I leapfrogged from fifth to third on the final day's time trial and became the first and only American to stand on the final podium of the Vuelta. I began the race begging my team for a new contract and frustrated with a sport, proving myself in, in this sport. But as the race ended, I had, I had offers from some of the best teams in the world to lead them in the biggest race in cycling, the Tour de France. This was the realization of a lifelong dream, but one that had come at some cost and which involved making a decision that I'm not proud. I'm here today to not only talk about my racing career, but about two ideas that are often thought of synonymously, dreams and success. Like many people who get up on stage and, and give talks like this, I had a dream. I had a dream at a very young age, and it pushed me to some pretty great heights. But along the way, I learned that success is a vastly different animal. It, it changes and shifts depending on circumstance, time, and as maturity sets in. And one of the biggest challenges that we may face is finding success as it diverges from our dream. I grew up in Butte, Montana, around hardworking people. My family worked a lot. My dad worked late every night at the family's ski shop. I was building bikes, tuning and mounting skis, selling shoes, and emptying the garbage before I was 10 years old at the outdoorsman. If we weren't working at the shop, it was taking on ambitious projects every weekend, like building a garage or a retaining wall. My parents even had me on skis shortly after my first birthday. As you can imagine, that would be pretty funny, but... <laughs> um, and where I grew up, there weren't a lot of kids my age, so I was forced to hang out with my older brother and his friends, and that meant keeping up with whatever they were doing. They were about seven, eight years older than I am. And when I got to be around 13 years old, that meant riding and racing bikes. And I remember the first time I ever got on a bike, I went to watch my brother finish a race, it was in September, and, and I jumped on his bike after the race, and I rode it around the block over and over, and I couldn't believe how efficient it was compared to my BMX bike that I had, had always had as a kid. So that was it. I decided to sell my BMX bike and trade it in for an aluminum Raleigh, which was my very first road bike. Of course, I had to wait six months because it was winter time, and I couldn't ride it because the roads were full of ice and snow. But by the time I did, the next spring, I was 13 years old, and for the first time, I saw the Tour de France on television. And I was mesmerized. There are certain images burned in my mind. I remember watching my childhood heroes like Pedro Delgado of Spain and Stephen Roach of Ireland as they would scale these tiny mountain roads in the Alps and the Pyrenees in, in crazy weather like fog and rain and scorching sun. And, and I'll never forget what it was like to watch Greg LeMond win the 1989 Tour de France in the 11th hour in Paris in the final time trial by a mere eight seconds, a record margin over the French champion Laurent Fignon. I not only remember where I was, but I remember what I was wearing and even what the room smelled like. <laughs> I was in love with cycling, and in rural Montana, that was a very tough girlfriend to have. 
I, uh, I tried all the normal sports. Um, I just couldn't get excited about throwing a ball around. <laughs> but um, in, in Montana, sports like skiing and especially road cycling were, were very foreign and, and looked down upon. So as I would be out riding in the roads in, in, in Butte, other teenagers would run me off the road or throw, throw objects at me. I was ridiculed for, for uh, participating in this bizarre sport. But I was in love with cycling. It offered me an escape, an adventure, and, um, and a way to test against others and nature, and most importantly, myself. I would always race against the 20 and 30 year olds, despite the fact that I was 14, 15, and 16 at the time. And my regular training partner, he was in his 30s, he would get off work around 3 o'clock and he'd got ride 100 miles in preparation for the race across America. I would almost always tag along and there was, I always remember there was this four mile pass near where we lived and we would climb it with the left leg and we'd descend and then we'd climb it with the right leg and we'd descend and we'd do that a few more times. So by the time I was 17, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I had a, my dream was set and nothing was gonna hold me back. By the time I was 19, I was on my way to Belgium, accompanying a friend who knew the ropes and he could help me on my way. So for the next three years, I lived in student rooms and, and old hostels, just uh, making, a way, making my way of uh, race winnings, all the while impatient to make, to make that next step up to the professional ranks. But in the time that I went to Belgium and my first few years as a professional in the US, I began to see a side of the sport that I hadn't anticipated, I didn't expect. And one example of that is during a three-day race in Belgium. I was sharing a, a room in an old hostel with five or six teammates. And this, this room had cold, hard cement floors and walls, three bunk beds, a sink, and nothing else. That was it. And one of my teammates, he had two suitcases, and I remember asking him, why did you bring so much luggage to a three-day race? Well, he, he answered by opening the suitcase to reveal a bunch of ampoules, pills, and syringes. And I was in total shock. I was blown away. And at first, it was very difficult to comprehend or gauge how pervasive the doping problem was in the sport of cycling. But little by little, after hearing from a friend or a teammate or someone I looked up to that they had participated in doping or knew of doping, I began to accept it as part of elite high-pressured sport. And bit by bit, this was confirmed by riders testing positive and other investigations uncovering other doping cases. So as I signed my first contract to ride with one of the biggest teams in the world at the highest level, I began to seriously consider crossing that line myself. And after a year or so of struggling with that decision, at the age of 27, I took a full step across that line. And I used performance enhancing drugs to prepare for the race that would launch my career, that 2001 Vuelta. And I continued to do so for the next six years for that race that mesmerized me as a child, the Tour de France. Now, carrying around that secret for a while, that wasn't easy. It was hard on a lot of relationships and the people that I cared about. I ended up letting a lot of people down and disappointed with me. And that's something that I have to live with. Looking back, I think those, those early years of feeling like a, a weird outsider, not feeling like I belonged where I grew up, really shaped my actions and my personality. I was lucky to be instilled with a strong work ethic and the fear of quitting and failure. These are all good qualities, yet I went on long solo training rides as a, as a teenager while most kids were hanging out doing well, whatever it is that kids do. <laughs> this more or less made me somewhat of, a, of an introvert and, and um, more or less antisocial, which is something that unfortunately follows me around to this day. And this proves rather difficult considering that my achievements as well as my mistakes are somewhat notorious. Des despite all of this, I, I want to help the sport learn from my generation's mistake. 
I would have rather grown up today or started my career today in, in uh, the climate of strong anti-doping authorities, advanced testing, and many teams' culture of anti-doping. These are truly better times for the sport of cycling, and I'm excited at the prospect that today's generation won't have to face the same choices that my generation did. But I got lucky along the way. I actually quit doping after the 2007 Tour de France, despite reaching the podium, despite fulfilling that dream of the 13-year-old kid. But that dream seemed a long ways away. I had compromised myself in service of that dream. And I have little doubt that most top riders from my era face that same struggle. <clears throat> but at the time, I was still a pro, and I trained as hard as ever and I actually began enjoying some of the best results of my career. And in a way, I fell in love with the bike again. I saw what the bicycle meant to a lot of people. I saw the Tour of California come here to Santa Rosa. I saw the enthusiasm of the hometown crowds, and it made me very proud to be part of this community. And looking back, I think creating something like the Grand Fondo was just a natural extension of that. And at the time, it was you know, I predicted or hoped that it would just be a simple, fun ride amongst the few hundred or so that I expected to show up. But there was 3,500 people that first Grand Fondo. And today, Levi's Grand Fondo has 7,500 people from all over the world coming to Sonoma County to, to experience what we have. I'm gonna lose my place. <laughs> I recently announced as unceremoniously as I could my, my retirement from professional cycling, that my peers and I cooperated with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency and admitted to our past doping, combined with my relative age in a young man's sport, meant that I was out of pro cycling a year earlier than I anticipated. <clears throat> I focused on a dream since I was 13 years old, and I refused to let anything get in the way, including the choice to use performance-enhancing drugs. And even though this all didn't turn out how I thought, I still look back and I see success. <clears throat> Some, but somewhere along the way, that success became more than just winning. It became a larger part, uh, being on the podium became a larger part of that overall success, <clears throat> which continues today, working with high school cyclists, expanding and growing our Grand Fondo charities, and telling my story, as complicated, as complicated as it is, to who will ever listen. <clears throat> and despite ending my career early, and despite the mistakes I made, I maintain that my success continues. Even if it's not the simple dream of that 13-year-old kid, and I'm not sure what he would say to me today if, if he saw me, but I'd, I know that I'd want to share my journey with him, and I'd hope that he'd understand that the pursuit of that dream ended up bearing a totally different success. Dreams are valuable, simple things. They drive us, they haunt us, they grant us clarity in a world of misdirections and distractions, but they're also a little bit naive. Success, on the other hand, is complex, it's subjective. We get to create it, we get to grow into it, and we get to carry it around for the rest of our lives. I'm thankful for my success, imperfect as it may be, and I look forward to all its promises in the future. Thank you.